Uh, thank you. I would really like to thank Cecile and Jean for the invitation to Bordeaux. It's the weather has cooperated, and I can say, not only is it my favorite city in France, it's my favorite city in Europe. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, uh, I will uh, talk. I'm not. My research is not so. It's only dynamic in that I work for a clinician who seems to give me new orders every day, but. There is a little bit about updating calculators with time, and in that sense, it's dynamic. So I want to talk about a specific example of prostate cancer, uh, which has to deal with the experience we've had running probably the most used uh, prostate cancer risk calculator. It's available online, of course, and it was built on a very large clinical uh, prevention trial called the Prostate Cancer Prevention Trial in the US. This is a trial that was treating <coughs> healthy men for uh, prostate uh, cancer. So the prediction I'm talking about is diagnosis. I'm, I'm asking the question, should we perform a biopsy on this patient today? So I'm trying to predict already if we have prostate cancer. Prostate cancer, by the way, is, is very common. About one in six men will get it in their lifetime. Uh, but it often doesn't kill you. Uh, so there's an over-diagnosis. And so, but because there's so much cancer, there's a lot of biopsies and there's a, a lot of harm to the patients. Uh, so there are concerns there. Now, we built the, tri we built the calculator based on about 6,000 biopsies that were performed in the placebo arm of this trial. And what was unique about the trial is that every man at the end of seven years of screening had to have a biopsy, no matter what his value of uh, prostate specific antigen was. So this is a very unique thing to ask for a man to undergo a prostate biopsy. So we had a very good data set, we had a very good cohort, and it was going to be a once in a lifetime cohort because you can't just go around biopsying healthy men with no indication. Uh, it's available online uh, at this website, and there's a disclaimer page, and my name and email are listed there. I routinely get queries or questions from patients and doctors using it. Uh, it's been accessed up to now 153,000 times. It's in the American Cancer Society guidelines for screening, but that's because my boss wrote the guidelines. And uh, the initial uh, calculator reported risk, you, it has a very set of simple risk factors. Probably the most important risk factor is this prostate-specific antigen, which Cecile talked about. It's, it's a very big clinical uh, marker measured in the blood. Uh, but a few others combine together to give you some sort of accurate risk. So you just go and you type in your menu and out comes this risk online. We recently changed the face page uh, of the results to make it more patient friendly. Uh, also to recognize that there's two types of cancer. There's a low grade, uh, sorry, this yellow uh, cancer. And there's a high grade, Gleason grade, Gregory Gula 7. And so now the doctors in the U.S. are starting to, uh, if you have a low-grade cancer, to put it under active surveillance and not necessarily operate. Uh, for high-grade, you might typically do a prostatectomy, <laughs> removing the whole prostate, and, uh, or radiotherapy. When you do undergo a biopsy, there's a chance in about 2 to 4 percent of men undergoing the biopsy will get an infection. And if you ever have a hospital procedure, you get an infection, you have to go right back to the hospital. Uh, because this can kill you, and so you get, if you know the temperature increase, uh, you go back in. And we put this in there so you can help in the decision making for prostate cancer. The model itself is based on a multinomial or not nominal logistic regression. And as I said, you have some standard risk factors. The, hot, the most impactful is the prostate specific antigen. From this, you get two scores, and you can convert these scores, these linear predictor combinations, into the risk of no cancer, low grade cancer, or high grade. Sometimes we just add these <coughs> risks of low grade and high grade to get the overall risk of cancer. It's a very transparent model. We've tried more complicated models, but using model selection, this is the best. The calculator can also be found on this website by the National, uh, U.S. National Cancer Institute. They have really taken an active role in collecting the risk calculators for all cancers. So uh, you can find ours under prostate cancer. You can also find one from the European Randomized uh, Screening Trial of Prostate Cancer that was produced in the Netherlands up there. 
uh, but you can look for any cancer. And you'll find hundreds and hundreds of risk calculators, as, we, as Dr. Moon said yesterday. <clears throat> the government shut down still, as I checked this morning, but the website's still running. Uh, other people post calculators, and uh, Cleveland Clinic in particular, because of this guy, has a lot of calculators in the more clinical setting. If you are trying to predict recurrence of prostate cancer or bladder cancer, almost any kind of little patient population operation that can be done, there's a prediction model. And I was kidding Mike at a recent conference that he has a risk calculator for everything. And he said he now has a calculator to make your own calculator. So there's calculators to make calculators now on the, on the web. So now it's, it's very easy. Now, you know, there's been complaints about all these online risk calculators. But the fact is, once we started putting risk calculators online, we started getting lots of validations. Because people need to publish papers, and it's much easier to give your risk tool to somebody to validate them, to ask them to give you data. So the, our calculator has been validated in the literature 52 times, including in Asia and Germany and uh, other populations. Now, when you make a calculator, and Dr. Moon spoke about this a little bit yesterday, you like to think there's some underlying science, and there's a one calculator, you get that perfect cohort, and you make it, and you're done. That's, it's not like that. It's like having a child. So things, things change, and you're going to have, the clinical practice is going to change, and your cohort is, is probably going to become out of date over time. And so what we found since 2006 is that there's been a lot of changes in the landscape for prostate cancer, extreme amount of changes. And uh, so uh, what we found that, and I'll show some examples, that these calculators, our calculator was working sometimes in some populations, not in others. Uh, there's been change to the, to the biopsy technique, as we'll see. And it occurred to me quickly that I'm going to have to be, be changing the calculator, just like the iPhones are coming out with a new version and in, in prostate cancer, we're at an advantage because there's a lot of biopsies performed and a lot of them are positive. And so we, we don't have a problem collecting data. It's there. The second change that occurs in clinical practice is that there's, there's huge groups working on discovery of new markers, genetic markers, serum markers, huge funding incentives for this, as we also saw yesterday. And when a new marker gets discovered, you want, and it works, and it becomes approved, you want to put it into your calculator. And so the question is, how do you do that? You cannot go back and measure that marker on the original cohort, because the original cohort is gone, and the blood and the serum gets stored for a little while, but then it's used up. And so you're going to have to find a way to do a mathematical merging of two cohorts, let's say, rather than measuring. You cannot expect these days to measure everything on one cohort because individual groups are working on genetics, and those people don't talk to the individual groups working on biomarkers, etc. So what happens is you need to build a risk model taking information from various sources. And then you, want, you need to fix those individual components as they break down, just like you do a car or you add a room to a house. So uh, let's talk about the first part. So Andrew Vickers, who's a collaborator of mine, he started to notice the same thing that, that I did, which was that there were many publications of the validation of our calculator. In one journal, one paper would say our calculator worked, the other would say it didn't. And he, he felt like this whole, this, this whole prediction model splurge has gone out of control. Everyone's created models, and they, they, everything results are all over the place. The models give different predictions for the same patient. They can validate the AEC can range from 50%, which means it's a bad model, to 80%. So he wrote a JCO article that said prediction models, they're revolutionary, but do they do more harm, more good than harm? And he noted this, that there's, there's such a confusion out there about risk models. And everyone's putting it on the internet. And so he created the Prostate Biopsy Collaborative Group, and he basically convinced seven European and three US biopsy cohorts or screening studies to donate data to us. And so we ended up having 25,000 biopsies from 22,000 patients with 8,000 prostate cancers. And the aim of this, our first paper, was to show that validation is a property of both the prediction tool and the cohort. So, a lot of times, the risk model is blamed for bad validation. It's not always the risk model's fault. 
It can be the, the cohort's fault, which you'll see in a minute. So we have uh, here about 10 cohorts, and some of these were coming from Europe. There's a very famous screening trial in Europe, the European Randomized Screening for Prostate. And some, uh, these are screening trials, and some were from clinical centers in the United States. These are referral centers. Men come in. Typically, they've been screened before, and they found an elevated PSA. They were referred. And so uh, there's big differences in, in these cohorts in terms of if they're screening or not. And uh, also the biopsy scheme, there's a six core biopsy. So they take six samples from the prostate versus you can take more cores. Obviously, the more samples you take, the better you increase your chance of finding uh, cancer. So what I first started to do as one of the initial analysis was to say, well, let's look at the validation of PCPT risk calculator across these 10 different cohorts. So it should all give good validation or all bad. Uh, and I, you know, I'm a disciple of Eval Steyerberg, and he wrote a nice book here. And so we tend to look at calibration separately from discrimination. And then there's something called clinical net benefit, which actually combines, uh, it just looks at sensitivity and specificity weighted by prevalence. So I'm not going to show it here because it's rather involved. And there's many more metrics, such as the virus scores we saw, but these are the ones that tend to be used most often in neurology. So if we look at calibration, it's good that we saw some plots like this yesterday. I have 10 cohorts, so I have 10 calibration plots, and all I've done is to, I'm plotting the risk. In each person in a validation set, I evaluate the risk of cancer according to my model. I group the people by deciles of the risk predicted by my model, and then within each decile grouping, the patients with the 10% lowest risk, I look at what fraction actually got cancer. I hope that 10% of that group got cancer. So I have expected, I have predicted by my model the x-axis and observed fraction in the y, and the diagonal line is where the two agree. So you want to be on the diagonal line, which we sort of are fairly well for the European randomized screening trials, which are very similar to the trial that I used to build my calculator, which also used a six-core biopsy technique like my my cohort had. And then I look at the right and I see that we're under predicting for some of these clinical cohorts, including the Cleveland Clinic, the Protect, which is in Austria. Uh, no, sorry, that's in Great Britain, Tyrol is in Austria. And uh, we're under predicting also in the Durham VA Hospital in North Carolina. I'm not we're not upset by this because these, as I said, the prevalence of prostate cancer is very high in these cohorts. And it was mentioned yesterday uh, that you can't expect your calculator to work if you go apply it to a population that's very different, if you don't recalibrate the whole, whole thing. So we're fine with that. You can't adjust the prevalence or the intercept in your calculator. Uh, so, but what you do see from here is that basically, more or less, before we had published this joint calibration, individual papers that each published a calibration and said our calculator was calibrated or not. The same with the AUC. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of work from Eval Steyerberg and some people in Belgium. Uh, if you have three groups, which we do, which is no cancer versus low grade, no cancer versus high grade, and low versus high grade, you have technically three AUCs. Uh, there's something called the generalized C index, which weights three ABCs for every pairwise prediction by the prevalence number of pairs in each grouping. But there's some new methods that look at overall set prediction. So that's an active area right now. As we know, we want the AEC to be it, it equal to value of 50%. If, there's, if your model's no better than flipping a coin to determine who has cancer, and it, uh, it can go up to 100%. You want higher is better. So if we just look at this last column, what we see was there was extreme variation in the AUC across these cohorts. So it was very low, no better than flipping a coin of our model in the years PC Gothenburg uh, section, up to 70, 67%, say, in this support cohort in the US. So that's a pretty big range. You know, it's 18 points, a two point range here, uh, a big range. And, and my point was, this range is bigger than I've ever seen any new marker 
in the literature pushed an ABC curve. So people get excited and write a big paper about a new biomarker when they say, well, it improved the ABC by two points. But I have a better marker, which is just find a different cohort. And that's how you can get a bigger jump. Now, I tell that to my boss, but he didn't think that was the answer. So we should be worrying more about fixing cohort effect problems than necessarily improving models right now or you know, incorporating new markers. Or you know, there's all this fuss about how to measure improvement. We have a big problem, which is a cohort effect. Uh, can one risk calculator fit all? So that's the question. Well, we don't think so. And we plotted in these cohorts, we just did a low, forget a model, we just did a lowest smooth of the prostate cancer rates versus PSA, which is the leading marker in the models. And you can see this kind of big range. Some of these curves start off at three because they simply don't biopsy people with a PSA less than three. And, but even where you have all people being biopsy for PSA, you see this tremendous range. So Frank Harrell will say, well, add the other covariates like race and do the rectal exam, and that will explain the differences. It doesn't. So you can put all the clinical risk factors that have been proven and are standards for prostate cancer, and then insert as an extra covariate the cohort, and it's still highly significant. So we haven't, we're not able to erase the cohort effect by measuring confounders. So uh, there remains a case mix effect across different types of hospitals that cannot be explained away by covariates. Yet this is not the fault of the model somehow. So because we honestly don't believe there's any more covariates to be done. Uh, so uh, Steierberg again in his, in his group, or yes, along with Ben Benkowster, have talked about how do you adjust calibration for different case mixes. So that's one issue, and I'll give you a potential solution in a minute. Another is what happens when your cohort becomes outdated. So as I said, the prostate biopsy technique inserts a needle into the prostate at six right in location, three on each side. That was the old practice. Cancer is usually lodged here, and high grade is a subset of the cancer, and it'll be lodged in one small little part. Prostate cancer has a very favorable cure rate. It's, it's almost 100% curable, by the way. So it's, there's nothing to worry about, and um, it often doesn't grow. It remains very localized. Um, but what happened was that our cohort was collected from the late 1990s through the 2004, where people were using six cores, three samples here and three here. But now, modern practice is they take 12 cores, uh, six on each side. They've doubled the number of cores. And it's been documented in a number of papers that you increase the, the sampling, you increase the likelihood of detecting, high, detecting cancer and high grade. So any of the new validation sets are going to have higher rates of prostate cancer than I could predict in my model. And that technique's going to get better and better because they're doing MRI, magnetic resonance, image guided biopsy. So then Andrew and I thought about this, and we thought, well, you know, there's a lot of biopsies being performed all over the world. You know, the question is, should we keep trying to fix up this, this calculator, even though it's starting to look like the foundation for which the calculator is really built on is, is, is cracked and old? And so we decided to start the Prostate Biopsy Collaborative Group 2 with some of the same centers and a few more. And, uh, and start to try to measure about the amount of prior screening and other uh, measured parameters that could possibly affect uh, the prevalence or whatnot in the data set. And so this is a grant that we have uh, submitted now to the NIH. I'm not sure if it's going to get funded. So, but we have PCPTR, we have the first biopsy collaborative group to work with. So my idea was that in practice, what we think about doing is updating a calculator every year. And so, and we also want to ask ourselves, is it going to be better to do it for each institution separately or pooled all together? So the study we're going to do now is to, we want to envision we would yearly update a risk model. Because what happens in hospitals is there's prostate biopsies being performed every day. It goes into electronic medical records automatically, and we can access that at night. So every day we could, in principle, update our calculator. 
Uh, so we're going to compare these different methods, and I don't have time to go through them here, but one is just to build a new model, right? And say, well, forget everything we know, we can collect the data pretty quickly, and let's build a new model from scratch every year. The second is, is Steinberg's ways, which is recalibration in the large. You simply use your <coughs> existing risk model as a covariate. It's a linear score, and you just re-estimate the intercept. Or if you do recalibration, you do the same thing, except the inter you estimate a new slope for your risk calculator. Revision lets you throw in some more covariates in addition to your risk model as a covariate. And then, of course, I like these traditional Bayesian approaches, uh, which would say we have prior information on the parameters from the PCPT data, and let's update the prior posterior every year. To me, this is very naturally Bayesian. And we want to automate this from electronic medical records. So at the end of the day, each institution that's bought into the system is getting their own specific risk for their case mix, and we can also pool it. So, um, all right, that's, that's, that's work in progress. So I have like, like 10 minutes left. The next thing is uh, these new markers coming in. So when the new markers come in, as I said, they're not typically, they're not measured with the same cohort you used to, so you can't use imputation or something. Uh, you, you have them on a completely different cohort. And if you're lucky, the new cohort has measured your standard risk factors. So the problem we faced was that, well, the problem is we need to update an existing risk tool and keep up with the science. So cancer biomarker research is dynamic. And new markers are constantly being discovered, tested, and validated by different groups and different cohorts. And it's a very active thing. And we cannot measure these markers retrospectively on the original participants of the cohort. And now the genetic markers are becoming so studied. And these are large multi-institutional consortiums. And they're not measuring the clinical risk factors like PSA, uh, et cetera, that I measure. So how are we going to integrate all this information that's out there when, in fact, we could never build a new cohort that measured all these risk factors, never? So it turns out the solution is very natural if you use Bayes' theorem, which is Bayes' theorem is a way for converting prior odds of a disease, multiplying it by something called the likelihood ratio of a new marker <coughs> to get what's called posterior odds. And the posterior odds of the prior odds can be converted to risk. So, so it's this likelihood ratio. And what is this? It's a retrospective measure that says, look in the cancer and non-cancer cases separately, and look at the distribution of your new marker Y given the standard markers X in each group. So just look to see. It's, it's what it, it turns out to be equivalent to linear discriminant analysis or quadratic discriminant. You're just asking when a new patient comes in, does their marker, and they have a new marker Y, does it look more like something that was seen in the cancer cases or the non? So if this thing is bigger than one, it's going to inflate your prior odds of having the cancer. And if it's less than one, it's going to decrease. Okay, so uh, we first applied this in 2009 because there was a new urine marker measured in the urine, uh, PCA3, and uh, it was, of course, not measured with the same PCPT sample. So this is the prior odds formula if you use logistic regression here. Here I'm just combining, I'm not doing three groups, just overall cancer. And all we did was to model using linear regression, assuming a normal distribution for the log of PC3, we modeled separately in ca cancer cases and controls. So you get a nice, easy model, and you get confidence prediction. And it was by the Delta rule. We published this updated thing. We did, a, we did, we did have an external validation set that we published along with the analysis. We showed minor improvement. But by publishing it online right away, uh, very quickly, three months later, an Italian group had uh, compared our updated calculator for, piece, for this new marker to one they developed on their own Hamburg data set. I'm sorry, this was in uh, Italy. And uh, they found that ours was, was better. It was 80% AUC compared to 71. That doesn't always happen that way. Often it, it happens that ours is worse or something. But you know, they talked about these head-to-head. -head. And the way this happens is you put your formulas online. Now you can extend this to multiple <coughs> markers. Uh, we have two continuous markers that have since been FDA approved. That's the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. And uh, 
we then used a, a bivariate normal, but we're also using the T because we also find it's very robust to outliers, which tend to always be the case, often the case in biometric. And biomarkers are often measured with error, and there's often outliers. We're also looking at skewed T mixtures and, and skewed T distributions. And this can all be extended, by the way, more straightforwardly to more than two groups, cancer or no cancer. We use something called the Integrated Discrimination Index, uh, proposed in Piscina, to measure how much does this, uh, the, the new marker improve a risk calculator compared to the old. The, this, I like this IDI very much. It's more sensitive than the AUC to improvements in a model. All it is is the difference in the discrimination slope. The discrimination slope is just the difference in average probability between those who have the disease and those who don't. And you look at this. So you want this thing to be positive. And you can calculate a confidence interval. It's available in one of Frank Carroll's packages. You want this thing to be large. It's on the probability scale. It's not squared like the buyer score. We evaluated this on external early detection research network cohort. And we found we got improvement incorporating these new percent pre-PSA and pro-PSA markers, 6.3% uh, move in this. So. Um, now we're interested in genome-wide association study SNPs. So by now, there's been lots of multiply validated SNPs for prostate cancer. There's about 33 listed in this table from Kim et al. And these have each been based on separate large consortium studies, most of them in Sweden and Iceland. And it turns out that if you use this Bayesian method, you can incorporate simple summary statistics, because these are dichotomous or, or bind, uh, uh, discrete markers, all you do is you can go to a paper, like I pick one here, one SNP, and you have frequencies of the genotype. This genotype can have a TT, TC, or CC, and you count the number of ca cancer cases that have that genotype and the proportion of cases over the controls. And if you take the ratio for each one of the per percents, here 0.52 to 0.49, this is the likelihood ratio uh, for, uh, this is how the prior odds would get. If a new patient came in with TT, you would multiply their prior odds by 1.0. If they have TC, you wouldn't do anything. If they have CC, then you lower the risk. So you can get this from the published estimates. Of course, these genotype studies do not adjust for the standard risk factors. They don't measure them because they're used. They don't measure PSA and all these things. But we believe because it's genetics, it should be a little bit independent. That's not exactly true. There's been some of these in correlation. But we assume it's independent. And so our likelihood ratio is just a ratio of multinomial probabilities. You can either do it by the genotype, or you can count what's called the number of risk alleles. So Z would be the number of risk alleles, which is the allele that has confers the higher risk. Um, if there's multiple SNPs in linkage disequilibrium, uh, you would just multiply the, it, the, the joint distribution of the SNPs is the product of the marginals, which is nice because now you just get a product lactate ratio. So you can pull information for different SNPs from different studies all at once. If they would not be an LD, there's been a paper that would uh, use a Bayesian uh, analysis and infer the LD, the, the non LD information from the half map. We're not going that far. Multiple Okay, I'm out of time. But, all right, I'm going to do it three minutes, and uh, then you know, we can just forego the questions. So uh, you get multiple studies uh, that have reported the same SNP. So we're starting to do a, a meta. We're doing a meta analysis using the methods of Van Hulligan, and, uh, uh, and we have three likelihood ratios depending on three genotype from each study. So at the bottom here is where you get the meta analysis result, which is some average thing with random effects for study. And this is what you use for your updating. You, you find all the studies. It takes a lot of work. Um, another thing I'm interested in is I'm working with the Swedish Family Cancer Database. Sweden, uh, they, they run the all, only comprehensive family cancer database in the world. Every single member of Sweden, the government knows who their family members are and how many have cancer. <coughs> So I've been very interested in looking at the effects of a of, of family history as a cheap alternative to SNPs, that's measuring genetics. So all we do is we ask 
for instance, how many, uh, we ask each patient, how many of your first degree relatives, such as a father, brother, or son, have prostate cancer diagnosed less than six, 60 years of age? And so this is the number of men they have that are prostate cancer cases and controls, and for each man, we know the number of relatives. And so you can treat this like a SNP, basically, is all I'm saying. So instead of a genotype, number of risk levels to be 0, 1, 2, you count number of relatives. Uh, what you find, though, is it's, it's a lot of these family histories are very rare. So for a discrete marker to impact a risk tool, it has to have, A, a large effect like a large odds ratio or likelihood ratio, and B, it can't be too rare. If it's too rare, if the prevalence of that risk factor is low, most people don't have it, so it's, not, it's only helping a very small subset. Uh, at a recent conference, we saw that the genotype literature is slowing down because someone started to see the foreseeable SNPs in the future when we would fund GWAS studies three times as large as the ones now, and what they found was that uh, the effect sizes of the new SNPs to be discovered are going to be lower because we found the low-hanging fruits. And uh, the impact on the AUC, they did a projection on how much we would move the AUC if they said it's never going to be enough. Not enough as finding one good serum marker, like percent free PSA. So the day I heard this is the day I stopped working on SNPs. Uh, to close, um, I'm not the first one to advocate compartmentalizing models and building them up piece by piece and replacing the broken parts. Actually, I went back and read Mitch Gale, who has the leading breast cancer risk calculator used in the world. It's much more widely used than our prostate cancer or the prostate. In 1989, he already had implemented an online risk tool and a frequentist approach uh, to uh, put information about population. So it's a very interesting paper to read. And then he later incorporated SNPs. And his approach, which is a frequentist analog to mine, has been replicated for colorectal and <coughs> OK, I want to thank um, the people who helped me that in the city of Bordeaux. Jeremy and I walked by this restaurant last night, which I've seen in New York Times review. I think it's just a wonderful, fun conference. Thank you.